I told the sergeant, I want to go to war. Get me out of here. I don't want to spend the war being a drill instructor. So I wrote a glowing letter recommending me. He signed it. And a week later, I was off to pilot training. Uh, eight of us went in, I think, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. There's only five of us returned. Three of them, three of them didn't make it. There are a lot of things like that. We see people get killed. And <sighs> so, <laughs> I always say, I never made any bad mistakes in my life, but I sure made some good ones. There are no excuses in life, just choices. One of the one of the first World War II airplanes that people are able to uh, to identify is the Corsair, and there's good reason for it too. It's unlike any other airplane, propeller-driven airplane you'll see at an air show or at a museum. First, it's big and it's blue, and it's got those wings that are bent in the middle. And the other thing that always hits me is that it has all these impossible curves. It's, it's just an airplane that from every angle you look at it, it looks, like, it looks like a different airplane. And so there's a timelessness to it. You never get sick of looking at a Corsair because every which way you look at it, it's something new. Well, the first Corsair pilot that I met was Claude Hone. And I remember the day meeting him, this was, this was years and years ago, but I remember I walked into his office and I expected this, this little old man to be sitting behind a desk or whatever and I opened up the door and the first thing I heard was, here I am! And he had on his, his World War II leather flying jacket and his cap and his goggles on his head. And uh, you tell you what, you meet, you meet Claude and you don't forget him. From any angle, you look at him. Just start telling me, how'd you get involved in, uh, how'd you become a, a pilot? Well, that was, <laughs> there are no coincidences in life. They all happen because of a reason. I was an enlisted man in the Marine Corps and uh, before Pearl Harbor in 1941. And uh, <clears throat> Pearl Harbor came along and holy smoke, everything broke loose because the, everybody wanted to enlist in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps to stop Hitler or stop uh, Japan. And so uh, they made me a drill instructor. You a drill instructor? A drill instructor. Oh yes, I was a drill instructor. Up, two, three, double left, two, three. I lived with them 24 hours a day. I'd, I'd get them up in the morning at 5 o'clock and out drilling at 6 and all day long, put them to bed at night. And after about four months of that, I told the sergeant, I want to go to war. Get me out of here. I don't want to spend the war being a drill instructor. I said, one day, a letter came through and says, we need pilots desperately in Guadalcanal. Anybody in your command you think would be a good pilot, would you recommend him? So I said to the colonel, by then I knew him pretty good. I said, how about recommending me, colonel? He said, well, you write your own letter and I'll sign it. So I wrote a glowing letter recommending me. <laughs> he signed it. <laughs> and a week later, I was off to pilot training. We flew in these Stearmans, these, you know, double wing planes with an open cockpit. And uh, the first couple times up, I got terribly sick. And then the, the pilot sits in front and then the instructor sits behind. I didn't dare let him, so I found the secret. I knew I was going to fly tomorrow morning. I never ate the night before, and I never ate breakfast. So if I did throw up, I'd have the dry heaves, and he wouldn't know about it. I was, going to, I was determined I wasn't going to wash out. A guy by the name of Brock, he was our instructor. So us guys, we were Brock's hot rocks. <laughs> we, we, we thought we were hot, you know, to go to town and uh, see the girls at night. So. <laughs> Raymans, they were issued by the government 70 years ago. Man, we put that on, put our jackets on, went to town, wow. <laughs> 
before I went to Pasco, Washington, they gave us pre-flight schooling at uh, St. Mary's College, uh, just out of Oakland, California. They said we could have a sport. You want to take up basketball, football? I thought, man, I'm going to war. I've never been a boxer, so I took up boxing. So I tried to learn to de defend myself. And my instructor happened to be Jack Kempsey, the champion of the world. Then from um, Corpus Christi, Texas, they sent us over to uh, Daytona Beach, Florida <coughs> to get into the fighters. And back in those days, the fighters was a, a plane called the Wildcat. It was called the, uh, I don't know what the number is. F4F. F4F, F4F yeah, the F4F Wildcat. That's the plane that Joe Foss flew. And uh, it, it uh, to me, it was an engineer's nightmare because you take you take off with that plane, and you give a little throttle to the left, on your left side. You pull the stick back as you take off. Then, if you after you take off, you got to change hands, hold on to the stick, and reach down and crank up the wheels. And the, the and you got through cranking up, you'd push the stick forward and you're going right in. I thought, wow, but but twice of that and I learned what to do on that one too and it was fact it was night flying and I saw uh, down below two automobiles I saw those light headlights coming right at you there and I thought it was a plane coming right at me because I was was facing down so it's a wonder I lived through that one there were probably two or three hundred pilots on this old freighter it took us 21 days of pitching and going through the ocean, going through the ocean. Everybody's getting seasick until you got your sea legs. And we didn't, they didn't tell you where you're going in those days. In fact, when they issued me a leather fleece-lined coat, leather fleece-lined pants, leather fleece-lined hat, leather fleece-lined boots, they issued those to me and put me on a ship. What would you think? I thought I was going to Alaska. They unloaded us at Guam, and Guam was half occupied. The, the line uh, was probably two miles up the island, and the rest is still controlled by Japanese, and they were working up forward. And so we were taken off Guam and strafing uh, Saipan. See, Guam, Rota, and Saipan, three little islands in a row, uh, we had to capture those so we were, they were uh, on Saipan, a lot of cliffs, and they're dug in the caves of the machine guns, so we'd have to go along the water and strafe and try to, as close as we can, then we had to pull up because we hit the cliffs, see? Right. And we hadn't learned the skip bomb yet. We hadn't learned that, so all we were doing is, we had six caliber 50s that we'd shoot into those caves where they were. So whether you call that combat or not, I don't know, that's just the beginning. The story that you tell me of you being in Guam when the Japanese soldier climbed up inside that Corsair. Can you tell that? Yeah, I sure can. Um, Guam wasn't secure, and, and uh, the airfield is on a peninsula, a bunch of cliffs, well, cliffs. And uh, the Americans had, had, there were dead bodies laying around, there were tanks blown up, and uh, but we pitched tents there right next to our airplanes. And uh, at night, the Japanese were living in the caves down below, which we didn't know, and they would sneak up and try to get some food or anything. One morning, and there's no lights, you remember there's no lights, completely dark. So you go out and get your engines warmed up and you're ready to take off. And so there are about 16 of us in a line. And about uh, the second plane down from me, all of a sudden there was an explosion. And this explosion blew the, the bottom out underneath the cockpit, and it looked like uh, red hydraulic fluid dripping down. Well, come to find out, a Japanese had crawled into that plane, in that cockpit, in black of night, and crawled underneath the seat how we ever got there, it must have been a small guy. He crawled underneath the seat of the plane, 
with two hand grenades. And yeah, I suppose he was going to wait till the plane took off, but he couldn't wait any longer, so he laid one hand grenade between the legs of the pilot, put the hand, other hand grenade to his stomach. And they both blew off simultaneously. Well, the stick for the pilot is on a big long rod about as big as your wrist. And that took the whole thing and the pilot never got a bit of shrapnel. Never got a bit. It all went in. And then this dead, this Japanese, he was laying underneath there. And uh, so they, they're afraid he'd been booby trapped with another grenade. So they were real careful getting him out of there and put a rope around him and they got everybody back. And they finally pulled him out and got him down. And there he was. You think back, now think about as a 93-year-old man, and you think about that Japanese guy. Do you think that he was a hero, or was it a waste of a life? What, how do you process him? Both. Both. I, I think, man, he was trying to do something for his country, you know, as, as a hero, until he didn't do any damage to anybody, anything. So, so. There are a lot of things like that. We see people get killed. And <sighs> we got into Iwo Jima, and all we did was kind of patrol and strafe a little bit. On the, uh, the, if you look at the map, from Saipan to Tokyo, about halfway is an island called Iwo Jima. And if the bombers flew over Iwo Jima, they'd radio. Hey, watch out, they're coming. Get your fighters up there. So that's why we had to take out Iwo Jima. Right. And so that's why there was, I forget how many casualties, there were thousands of Marine casualties, I think 26,000 casualties. And I don't know, 100,000 of Japanese. The Corsair is one of the brilliant designs of aviation of all time. It was designed back uh, even before World War II, but when it got into World War II and first used by the Marines, it performed its task brilliantly. Not only was it this great air superiority fighter, but it was used in, in close, uh, close air support. It was used to support the Marines on the ground and, and drop bombs and strafe and do a lot of what air to ground work that is so common today, while well, the Corsair kind of pioneered that stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's every bit as uh, remarkable an airplane as, say, the Spitfire or the P-51 or, you know, the Messerschmitt 109. So doing the airplane is like doing an, an aviation icon. And when I was deciding which airplane to draw of Claude's, I had to decide between, well, do I draw the one that he used uh, while flying from the carrier Wasp? Or do I use the airplane that he flew from, you know, Guam? And uh, I decided to do 696 from Guam because it was the airplane that was truly rough and tumble. I mean, the airplane, I saw pictures of the airplanes and the people, the airplanes that flew off of Guam. They were dirty, they were grungy. They weren't the spotless, shiny blue carrier planes that Claude would fly months later. Now the the, the Guam-based Corsairs were 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 a tough warplane with that three-color faded camouflage, and um, uh, this was the airplane that I decided to me um, represented uh, Claude's service, the uh, the the everyday, the work a day, and at the same time the timelessness of, of it all. Well, you were on the first, um, the first Marine yep. strike on Tokyo. Oh, yes. I was on what the was first. that like? Uh, we learned the night before, tomorrow the target is Tokyo. Get as many zeros as you can because the bombers are going to come in. Uh, as soon as we get rid of the zeros, they're going to come in and burn up Tokyo. That was their strategy. You took off from a carrier on that mission. Okay, yeah. What, and what carrier was that? The carrier wasp. The wasp. The carrier wasp. Uh, what they did, they were trying to get in as close as they can without being detected. So we get in, and sure enough, we are hoped to get in with 100 miles. Sure, we were about 200 miles out, and they were across a Japanese trawler. So they knew the Japanese 
he had wired back uh, back to the homeland that we were coming. But we, so we went in right on the water, we call it on the deck. We were right in the deck, flying through a snowstorm and rain and terrible. It was a, it was a, um, I think it's the first week in February, or right in February, anyhow. So uh, we, were, we, were the first, we were the first eight that went into Tokyo, and we were on the water, and then we climbed up. Uh, Japan is kind of like San Francisco. There are a lot of hills, and then down the valley this, is this, down there's a beautiful harbor there that's navigable, and then it, it, there's a little river that goes out to the, uh, out to the sea. We go in low, try to escape radar or whatever it was. Then we climbed up high, up to about 7,000 feet, and then we went straight down strafing. And about that time, the zeros, were come, a few of them were coming at us, but uh, uh, Kennedy, who was flying number two position, I was number three, he, he broke off to face the, the zero, and the rest of us went straight on down. And <clears throat> all kinds of planes were taken off the runway. We were firing at all the planes and firing into the hangars. And the, the firepower was red tracers coming out. You, you don't think you, how you could ever, just like a blanket, you don't think how you ever get through any of that stuff. But we're, when the Marine Corps trains you to obey orders, you stay with your, uh, the pilot had you, I'm the wingman. So we go down strafing and had our guns going as fast as we can. Then, after we got down there, we were down to about, 50 feet, my uh, Colonel uh, George Dooley, he led us down further, got us down to the river. And well, here's all the machine gunners up in the hills. They were trying to swing around and their machine guns would not go down. So all of a sudden we were out of the line of fire. We were down below it. And we followed that river on out and sneaked on out and, and got, got out trying to find the carrier. So that's what it was really, Firepower, I guess. Yeah. Now, out of the, out of those uh, uh, eight of us went in. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. There's only five of us returned. Three of them. Three of them didn't make it. There was the carrier. About a half hour later, there it was, flying down there. I mean, sitting down there, snowing like mad, and the gas gauge was below empty. We were on vapors, I tell you. And if you went down in that frigid water. You wouldn't last over 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, and a carrier isn't going to stop. No, no, they're not going to stop. They're gonna, yeah. It can't stop. So anyhow, so we got in the pattern and come around, and all four of us got aboard, and there was no gas left in the tanks, period. <laughs> what, what, what's going through your head when you're, you're, you're doing that? I mean, can you recall? We're excited. We're getting in it. We were, we were young men in which they had you, they told you, Let's go get the enemy. Who wants to live to be a white-haired old man anyhow? You know, that's what they tell you, see. Let's go. So that I would say that's the most exciting part of the combat that I was in, right, right there. That was exciting. And that was in, well, today, this is 2013, that was 1945, so that's 68 years ago. 68 years ago that that uh, we were in combat. So, ask a question this, you know, I, this is an interesting, I, I get to talk to a guy, a warrior, what do you think about war now? I think it's terrible. I, it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't solve a thing. I don't know why. Real, I, I can interrupt you. Don't you think that the United States, we, we were, were we right in fighting Japan in 1941? We thought so too. We thought Japan's philosophy was we are the men, we are the rulers of the world. We are uh, chosen, we are chosen to rule the world. And they were going out and that's what they were going to do. They were going to, if, if we wouldn't have stopped them, I always say to the young men, if we wouldn't have stopped him, you'd be cheap uh, speaking Japanese right today. But war is not the answer. War is not the answer. I don't know what the answer is, but uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes I think 
that this is all my life. It's all decided ahead of time. I think I, when the good Lord says I'm going to go, I'm going to go. But uh, that's the way I feel about it. As, as the older I get in life, the older I think of there's, I really don't have any control over this. He has control. So the question I ask to you, is that a function of your wisdom or your age? My experiences, I think. I have no regrets. If I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd make the same mistakes. So <laughs> I always say, I never made any bad mistakes in my life, but I sure made some good ones. So <laughs> if you were to go back, I mean, if we were to come back and bring 21-year-old uh, Claude. Yeah. How far apart is 93-year-old Claude from 21-year-old Claude? Oh, completely diff different, you know. I mean, back there, you're uh, immortal. You figure you're immortal. Well, what I'm getting at, you know, you're, is I want to know how much, how much of us stays the same from when we're born to the when we die versus, you know what I mean? I, I want to know, because if I met Claude Hone when... Am I going to meet the same guy, or did you have some moment where you became a different man? I, I, we're changing all the time. We're changing all the time. We're changing, changing, changing. But you got to change if you're going to grow. So just do the best you can as you go along every day and, and be kind to people. What is American freedom? What does that mean to you? To me, it means the right, a right to express your own opinion. The freedom of religion, you choose whatever you want to do in religion. It means the freedom of owning a house, and the freedom of going to whatever job you want. That's my definition of freedom. You have your own choice. And uh, I always say, there are no excuses in life, just choices. And I think this is why nothing bothers me anymore. You know. When, when things get tough in the business and things are all going apart and everything is falling apart, I sit back and say, what if I wasn't here? Calm me down. Gets me right on through it. So, then we go on to the, so, so life, is, and, and life takes its turns. It's turning now. Something new is happening. So, it's wonderful. So. <laughs> Claude Hone is and always will be in my pantheon of heroes. He's a man who has gone from warrior to dad to business entrepreneur and seen the highs and lows and everything in between and done it with such a grace and, and beauty that um, the only thing I can say is that Claude's timeless. And he heard, heard from the word himself. I mean, he talked about how he embraces change. When I think about Claude, I, I have to think about the Corsair. Um, looking at a Corsair today, how beautiful it is, and yet knowing that it's a, it's a, it's a design from a way back time, yet it still looks just right. And I think the, the secret to, to all of this is the ability to change and the ability to stay current. Corsair started out as a warplane, now it's an air show attraction. Claude was a warrior, and now he's, he's a, a man of wisdom. Um, when I look at 696, I'm always going to be uh, compelled to think about how I can rise above and how I can adapt to tomorrow, as well as what good I'm doing today.